then I would now be very, I'm now very happy to introduce you to our keynote speaker, to Elena Pierazzo, who is uh, the professor for uh, European literature at the University of Tours, and she's directing all the digital humanities activities, including a master study program on digital cultural heritage at the University of Tours. Uh, Elena received uh, a doctoral degree at uh, the Scuola Normale Superiore of Pisa in Italian philology in 2001. Uh, from 2002, uh, um, she has been a research fellow at the Harvard Center for Italian Renaissance Studies in Florence. Uh, and she left uh, Italy in 2000, 2006 and worked for the next eight years uh, at uh, King's College London. So a really uh, important competence center for digital humanities research. Uh, and uh, in 2014, she was elected a professor at the University of Grenoble. Alp, uh, and again, five years later, she took up her current position in tour. She has been elected president of the TI consortium uh, from 2012 to 2015, so one of the most important consortia uh, in, in our field. Uh, and uh, in 2019, she was uh, the co-chair with Fabio Ciotti uh, of the DH uh, Digital Humanities Congress uh, in Utrecht, so the World Congress organized by the Association of Digital Humanities Organizations. Um, she has been awarded numerous grants, scholarships, visiting sp uh, professorships, and uh, from 2015 to 2018, uh, she was the scientist in charge for King's College in the large uh, Marie Curie network Dixit, where we closely collaborated, and that was a, a fantastic time, and uh, that made a huge impact on the on the field of uh, digital uh, textual scholarship and digital humanities uh, as a whole. I think. So, but that's our perspective, of course. Uh, she created also the Digital Franco-Italian Library Consortium and the online portal Fonte Gaia. She um, published widely on all aspects of digital humanities, especially on digital scholarly editing, of course. Uh, most notably, the standard reference work, uh, uh, Digital Scholarly Editing, uh, published in 2015. Uh, and just a couple of months ago, uh, a highly useful introduction together with our colleague and co-organizer Tiziana Mancinelli, uh, um, uh, a small book, a readable book, what is uh, a scholarly edition? Che cos'è un'edizione scientifica digitale? So it's in Italian. Uh, Elena grew up in the Veneto region in a small town close to Venice. Um, um, she followed her uh, own career path uh, through uh, European academic institutions, through, through the wide and open field of uh, an emergent dis discipline, ch challenging and transforming uh, the, our traditional academic culture. Uh, uh, a grand dame of digital humanities by now, <laughs> she, she clearly helped to shape and promote the field as we see it today. So in Italy, in France, in England and uh, globally. So we are uh, most glad uh, you are here with us today and uh, you are talking from Paris where you live and uh, where the lockdown has been extremely long and severe. So thank you very much indeed for being available uh, and talking to us today. Uh, the title of your talk is uh, very suitable for uh, uh, Digital Humanities uh, summer, summer Camp. Uh, what is Digital Humanities? Uh, an historical and sociological uh, perspective. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much, uh, um, Franz, for this uh, flattering introduction. Grand Dame, it was the first time for me to be called that way, so, so it's very time, excited. It's time. Uh, yeah. I've been called the, the um, uh, what is, Pretress, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, pred, uh, priest, uh, the high priest of the <laughs> TI, but that is a different thing. Okay, I try to share my screen now. Ah, yes, I not only I, I'm was born very much close to Venice, but I did study there. So I am an, um, my alma mater is actually uh, Venice Cafoscari, so which I think of it really very much as my hometown. I can, I try now to share my screen uh, because I change a bit setting, I hope it will work. Are you seeing my PowerPoint? Are yes, you, is yes. that okay? Yeah, yeah, seeing your screen. Thank you. 
Okay, so now I'm launching the presentation. Just give me a second. Is that right? Perfect. Can you Perfect. Okay. So I'll try to keep on time. Um, what is digital humanities? That's the first question. And because there is plenty of definitions, plenty of misunderstanding, as many definitions as there are misunderstandings, I, I fear. Um, because uh, DH has a very wide impact from a disciplinary culture and society point of view. And therefore, it's very difficult to define. We shall see how much these difficulties on defining what is digital humanities uh, impact all sorts of problems, disciplinary, scholarly, societal, etc., etc. So let's start with a definition because uh, uh, everybody gives their own definition. I give mine. It's only one of them, and not necessarily even the best of them. To me, digital humanities as first of all a research component, and he has to do with the digitization of cultural heritage, uh, digitization of text, objects, music, and uh, whatever. And uh, asking the question like, what is the theoretical challenges are behind that? Which is the model? What are the models that we follow when we do this digitization? It also has to do with the use of this digitized culture and see what is the difference between using a digitized culture or a real cultures. These days with the lockdown, we have seen how much is different the approach to things uh, when they are virtual or when they are in presence. So that is some reflection we can have in the age. And what is most important for me from a research perspective is what can we do with the digital that we couldn't do before? Because if we can say, oh, digital is as good as the real thing, to me, it's just uh, not very worth doing it. Let's do the real thing then. But we need to find something, and I think there is there something that we can do and we couldn't do it before. But it's also a practical component. The digital humanity is not just reflecting and thinking about things. It's actually doing all these things and therefore uh, asking ourselves which is the difference by using a methodology another methodology which is the impact of on one language over another language etc etc so it's not just thinking about the digital in theory but actually being able to do it in my opinion one can ask which is the, the relationship between dh and computer science and uh, many people think that when you say what do you do i'm digital humanities oh is that you informatics for the humanities which is actually hides informatics for the dummies or for the new for the people that don't know anything anything about it um in my opinion it's better before answering this question to see it from a, an historical perspective how the computer has been used in the past and how it is used today in many areas of the digital humanities. And so I have uh, um, create, uh, elaborated uh, 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 history of the age in four phases. So some of you have already heard of this talk, so forgive me for repeating it in front of you. Um, I call it the first the phase, the computing, the humanities phase, the second, the humanities computing, the third, digital humanities, and the fourth, the digital act. We shall see what uh, that means in a moment. So we start with the first phase, computing the humanities. Uh, it is the years of 50s, 70s of the past century. Uh, traditionally, we make start of the digital humanities in 49 with Father Buza, um, Father Roberto Buza of the Catholic University of Milan, that has this, this brilliant idea. of a cocktail to meet with CEO uh, of IBM and asking them, you know, I know that uh, recently you have formed these new funky things called computers uh, and uh, I have a funky things uh, with uh, the index domesticus uh, with the uh, uh, St. Thomas of Aachen and I need to do something with that. Can we try and talk to each other? So this is uh, Father Buza in case you wonder how he looks like. And so from the uh, 50s, uh, he started to use the new uh, IBM computers that were recently, uh, the computers were born for the, for the war, of course, and then have been started to be used for civil usage uh, around the end of the 40s. And they were looking for use cases. They didn't know what to do with that, actually. And so he gave them a very interesting uh, uh, question to, to so how to make concordances of very large medieval Latin texts. And uh, here's another picture I like a lot. This is uh, in Gallarate, where there was on uh, the, uh, the research team of uh, the Buza, where you see the comp computers 
that are working on their um, uh, cards, or that uh, the, the punched cards, uh, to make the uh, concordances of uh, um, St. Thomas on a very old approach. I like these pictures because it shows once for all how much uh, the contribution of women is as fundamental in the history of computing, but this perhaps is for another day. This is what I call the pioneer phase, is the moment which you start counting words, because computers are very good for counting things. And this is the moment computer scientists put themselves at the service, if you want, of humanities people that have research questions. It's the moment we develop the first algorithms for the creation of concordances, automatic collation, and automatic translation. Is the moment of the birth, where well, we see the birth of what we call today computational linguistics and natural language processing. It's also a very funny story that again, doing with the war. In the 50s, we were in the middle of the Cold War, and there were the problem with the started in the United States to detect the message from Russia. But they didn't have enough people uh, to be able to translate the uh, messages uh, from uh, that they were capturing because they were in Russian. And uh, all people that were speaking Russian at the time were actually considered spies or very much at risk of being one. Therefore, they didn't know how to translate all this stuff. And so they said, okay, well, let's use computer. At the end of the day, automatic translation is not that difficult. One word, one word, right? Well, we know that is not that easy. In fact, we haven't yet mastered it. But that's what gave the impulse of the birth of computational linguistics, actually. Um, Let's go on with the second phase. I will be very fast because I have a lot of things to tell you today. And we are talking about the 80s and the 90s. We've been very, very fast on our history. Is the moment where the TI, Text Encoding Initiative, we'll see in a moment what it is, uh, is born in 86. But it's also the moment in which the web, the World Wide Web, is invented in 93. It's the moment where the humanities people say, you know what, this uh, computing thing is not that difficult in the end. So instead of asking for their uh, colleagues and computer scientists that have become too very, very busy because now they found what to do with computers, uh, they decided to, um, to, to become computers themselves. So they learn how to code. It's the moment in which we uh, start to work on the textual representation for linguistics, for rhetorical, for documentary and literary analysis. That's why the TI and markup have become very, very important. Encoding is one of the keywords of this period. It's also the moment in which we develop historical databases and the first GIS uh, applied to historical data. And the development of first a digital scholarly edition, first of all on floppy disks, on then on CD-ROMs, and after, uh, at the end of the 90s, we started to move those on the web. Uh, it's also the moment in which the first big libraries came about. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about Gallica, that started in 92, uh, connected with the National Library of France, even before we had the Guten Gutenberg project, starting in 71, actually. Here, uh, I put a few pictures for you. Not many of you maybe know this sir. This mister is uh, Antonio Zampoli, who was pivotal for the creation of the Institute of Computational Linguistics in Pisa, the CNR. But also was very important for the creation of digital humanities as a field, as a word field, as you know it, because it was pivotal for the creation of the TI. This is a picture of the first meeting of the, well, the PUC Pixie. Uh, and um, uh, Antonio Zampoli is the second from right uh, that you can see uh, um, on uh, 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 crouched down. And you may recognize some other people, like uh, these two guys. Uh, we have on the uh, my right hand side is uh, Lou Bernard, the one with the hat, and the other one is the, uh, Michael Spell and McQueen, the two fathers of the TI. Um, that is the standard for the encoding of texts in our field that has actually had a very important role on creating a community, a worldwide community uh, for digital humanities. And here you have another man that is uh, not always credited in the history of the age, but sure, this Tim Barners-Lee, the inventor of the web, if you, of HTML. Uh, it's not, it was not strictly a humanities person, but he created that as f format for documentation internal at the CERN in Geneva. But actually, the web has a huge impact, not only on uh, digital humanities in the world, 
But in the digital humanity has been particularly important since we all we do nowadays is on the web, basically. Um, third phase, the phase of digital humanities, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, 2000, 2010, this is the years I consider. Um, the name itself, digital humanity, was invented in 2005 by uh, John Answorth. And I've seen a large growing number of techniques and tools, collaborative teams are created at this time. And it's a bit uh, of a change with respect to the previous phase. Uh, one important thing I wanted to say is that these phases are not one after the others, but they are cumulative. You can see the same things going on. The, the DH add the new layers, so they, but still the previous phase is still on if you allow me to do so, say that. Um, so the collaborative team is something that is new in a sense. The, the first phase was humanities people uh, knocking the doors of computer scientists and say, can you help me? Second phase is uh, uh, humanities people say, I can do it, I can learn, I can, and learn it by themselves. In the third phase, we realize as humanities people that perhaps uh, Computers is not that easy, and perhaps we have the need of professionals if you want to. Um, we need the, need the people that actually can program properly <laughs> to be able to do something very, very nice. And therefore, we create uh, the uh, collaborative teams where we have lots of people working around, uh, around us and create center for digital humanities. Is also the moment which we needed to start to manage to manage a born a digital data, large amount of data that we have started to produce and we want to preserve for futures. So we ask ourselves, how can we keep it alive for a long time? So we start to develop standards and the formats that allow us to um, make it our stuff last longer than the five year, five years that is normally is considered the normal round of obsolescence for digital stuff. And we start also to develop theories and understanding of what is actually digital and what the digital culture it is. It's the moment we develop what we call the digital scholarship, so doing scholarship using digital tools, but also doing the scholarship about the digital, which is the second approach. As you have understood uh, and now, I, by now I like pictures, so we have uh, here, for instance, a uh, uh, few uh, um, images. We have, first of all, the logos of the funding association of the ADO, the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organization, which is the worldwide organization for digital humanities, the European Association for Digital Humanities, and the ACH, which is the North American Association. But uh, shortly after the creation in 2006, we do have the creation of CenterNet, the network of the Centers of Digital Humanities. And then we have the Canadian Society for Digital Humanities that joined a few years later. And then the Australasian Association, and then the Japanese Association, and then Humanistica, which is the uh, French-speaking world of digital humanities. And then we have the South African, the Taiwanese, and you name it. So, the, we see how the digital humanities is expanding uh, while we speak, actually. Uh, here's another image is taken from a book that has had a hugely influential in the history uh, in the uh, study of literature using computer, which is a book by Franco Moretti, Graph Trees and Networks, uh, in which he applies um, data mining techniques, text mining technique, to literature and say, okay, what can we do with computer we couldn't do before, which is looking at the broader pictures. So like a, a drone that is flying over the world of literature, trying to see trends and patterns and things we couldn't see before, because we cannot read the thousand book, we cannot read a million of books that are now digitized, but we can use computers to give us information about it. And uh, here is a little history to an, an edit, uh, anecdote about digital scholarship, which is what I call the Joker Swartford affair. My two jokers, a professor of digital humanities, a strict collaborators of Franco Moretti, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, publishes uh, uh, on many newspapers, actually, was picked up uh, in his blog first and then picked up by Wired, by the New York Times. Uh, the fact that he was uh, able to develop an algorithm, able to detect uh, uh, sentiment, sentiment analysis. So we can know without reading a book, one of those millions of books that are now digitized, if it is sad or happy. 
if he talks about love or friendship, sentiment analysis. He publishes that and a uh, lot of success. So he's interviewed here and there. And uh, a PhD student, Sani Swofford, you see on the right hand side, uh, start uh, downloads the uh, material that he puts online and tries it with her own corpus. And she cannot do it. So she writes on Twitter, said, uh, it doesn't work. I said, yes, of course it does. And she said, no, it doesn't. And so a few weeks later, after a very um, long exchange uh, uh, with uh, hundreds and hundreds of tweets and a few blog posts published on both sides, Matthew Jokers uh, admit defeat. His algorithm does not work. He withdraw it and say, OK, I need to work it longer. And reflect on the fact that that took three weeks to, f to find out that there was a problem, a fundamental flaw on his own uh, research, and said, in, in a previous world, it would take years, uh, you know, presenting a conference, uh, publishing the, the um, proceedings, and then people trying out and now. And now, in two weeks, three weeks, uh, we can put an hypothesis, test it, and start again if that doesn't work. Fourth phase, last phase uh, the, in my uh, chronology is what I call the digital X. What is X? X is whatever you want it. So it can be digital history, digital philology, digital art history, digital archaeology, and you name it. Everything becomes digital. And uh, it is the moment in which we kind of uh, say, okay, the digital humanity is whatever you want it to be. Uh, that that uh, everybody is doing it because being doing digital humanities is like being in love. Nobody can tell you if you are in love. You, only you in your heart can can tell if you are. So that's that's more or less what we are at now. It's also the moment in which digital humanities become digital without the coding. When lots of articles and books are published by people that cannot code, they just reflect on what is digital humanities. Which for me, you can understand, is not a good thing. Uh, it's also the moment digital humanities uh, uh, deals with the issues like multilingualism, multiculturalism, diversity, racism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's the moment in which we do ask ourselves, which is the role of research and or researchers within the digital society, and question of ethics are raised. Uh, uh, you know, the heroes of these stories are certainly. Uh, Snowden, which uh, uh, made us uh, avail, um, aware of the problems with putting data online, what does it mean, and all the problem with privacy or sharing uh, of our data, and what people can do with the data we put online. But also with Aaron Schwartz, Aaron Schwartz, who is what I call the martyr of the uh, open access. Um, if you don't know his story, his history, please go online and find it out. There is a, ma a wonderful movie about him, The Internet Own Boy, which is made freely available online. He was uh, uh, convicted uh, uh, for having downloaded uh, art, uh, scholarly article from JSTOR some, and then uh, committed suicide afterwards. So he's someone that uh, you should look for. It's, uh, that's his name, Aaron Schwartz. But it's also the moment in which uh, these days uh, we have seen a lot of discussion online about the, the case about Elena Ferrante. Who is Elena Ferrante? We know very well the story, many of us know that, the fact that she that we don't know if uh, who is she or even if is a she or a he. And a few colleagues have started to use a digital humanities technique to find out who is Elena Ferrante. And uh, the same applied to uh, J.K. Rowling that published a uh, uh, few books after the, having finished their saga of Harry Potter under the name of Robert Galbraith. And uh, the question is uh, the fact that, that we can find out who is these people and we can find out who wrote what, does it mean that we should? Does it mean that we have to do it? and start to ask a question about ethics, something that is not necessarily uh, a, a question that many people in the humanities have to ask themselves. But nowadays, with the digital, it becomes much more irksome, this question. So this is a little bit of the overview of the history, but now I would like to get to the sociological part of it and try to understand what does uh, uh, digital humanities and the others means in this uh, slide. 
um, we have seen how the evolution of digital humanities has been uh, going uh, back and forth uh, in respect uh, to computer scientists. But what about uh, the other disciplines in the humanities? What, how digital humanities perceived by our colleagues uh, in the traditional departments and how it is located in our universities? In fact, digital human humanists come in all sorts of shapes and flavors, we know. And they're spreading everywhere. So the Center of Digital Humanities are developing everywhere. We have lots of masters, one in Venice. Uh, we have two in Tours and many other places in Europe and abroad um, that are forming the next generation of digital humanists. But in many cases, this development of digital humanities happens in a hostile environment because we do not go along very well with the others. Um, is there any way that we could transform what is perceived, uh, in fact, as a dangerous virus uh, into a drive for innovative research? Is there any way we can see how we can uh, deal with uh, other people in uh, our universities and around the world without uh, being perceived as bad? Uh, first of all, are we really perceived as bad? Um, there is a lot of discussions in the digital humanities world, what is digital humanities and how it deals with other discipline. Uh, here I'd like to quote an article by Jeremy Haggett about digital humanities from an archaeological perspective. And uh, what he's sent to say is that the relation between digital humanities and individual humanity discipline is difficult. And one of the reasons because it is difficult is uh, because of the difficulties of defining what digital humanities actually is, as we said before. And uh, we can see, it says that how the traditional humanities perspective, the age is something, the new kid on the blocks that sucks up all the funding and everybody is jealous about it. Uh, on the other hand, we can ask if uh, um, what is really digital humanity apart from this content, we can go back at that one, is that a movement toward the modernization of the humanities, so it's the humanities, but as we know it, but digital, or it will give birth to digital disciplines that are parallel uh, to digital, to the non-digital discipline. So we'll have history and digital histories as opposed to each other or as part of each other. That's what is the question here. And here I love to quote these uh, uh, wonderful articles about Matthew Kirschenbaum, What is Digital Humanities, published in 2014, in which he has collected all sorts of uh, quotation, what is digital humanities? Uh, for instance, is digital humanities is managerial, digital humanities academic importing, uh, import of Silicon Valley solutionism, and uh, digital humanities does not inhale. Uh, digital humanities were Google Glass, digital humanities were thick, thick glasses, etc., etc. So there is a bad press around digital humanities, and uh, you can see it everywhere, like a few months ago, in, uh, in France, there was a huge fuss about uh, uh, Frédéric Laver, which I saw here before, I can tell about that. Uh, les humanités numériques n'existent pas. So it is something still very controversial. And uh, what is uh, actually the most damning thing so that seems to appear, that digital humanities does want to be separated from the rest of the humanities, and we really like it that way. That's one is the perceived uh, a point of view from many other disciplines. To understand what's true about it and what's about it, actually, I try to study digital humanity from a sociological, anthropological perspective, uh, asking myself, which is the ecosystem? Where do digital humanities work and live? Which social models applies to them? And how they do interact with other members of the species? Um, so, by studying that, I have uh, elaborated two social models. The first one, historical models, I said. The first is the one, the lone wolf. And the second is the pack in hostile, indifferent environment. Let's see them both. First of all, with who is the lone wolf? The lone wolf lives in a department or faculties of English, Italian, history, fine arts, you, you name it. 
is the only teacher uh, within uh, this department it has a complicated relationship with their colleagues because they ask them to change the toner or the printer or they think that their scholarship is not real or weak and they're mostly most of the time very jealous of the attention they receive from the administration the lone wolf feels very very lonely and normally finds his peers online at conferences he escapes from uh, the sadness of his uh, um, lack of relationship with uh, his colleagues or her colleagues. Their relationship with their, uh, their home discipline is complicated. Is uh, The uh, lone wolf is torn between uh, res researching and publishing with his home domain and the age because the research is not often correctly evaluated uh, and the methodology is uh, felt foreign on both sides. So it's very complicated. Um, here we have a, a similar remark by Doug Rosai that uh, observe how scholar programmer, that like this discipline, a scholar programmer, in a traditional humanities department may find it challenging to communicate the value of her work to her colleagues. The consequences of this is that the lone wolf leaves the institution and join a path most often, or the lone wolf ignores their colleague and build a career in a virtual art alternative space until they burn out, unfortunately. And in many cases also happen the lone wolf leaves the age and re-enters the home disciplines because they cannot do it. The second uh, environment, uh, uh, the second model I wanted to talk about is the one of the PAC. What is a PAC, first of all? The PAC is a center of Department of Digital Humanities or Digital Culture, New Media, or Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities. It's uh, some of the centers that you find under the umbrella of the ad hoc, for instance. It's made of a group of think-alikes that tend to isolate themselves from the rest of their institution. So that is a big risk. So you create these beautiful centers and then you separate from the others because the others don't understand you. Because why they don't understand you? Because you have a different business and financial model with respect to the other department. It's mostly project-based, based on soft money. You have people that are hired for, um, for project and not for life. And they have different profiles, these people. Mem even within uh, humanities department, you may have computer scientists, you may have engineers. So people that no normally you won't find them employed in that particular uh, environment. The relationship with the others is complicated. These uh, centers uh, perceived most of the time as a service, which is an, um, for another uh, faculty or another uh, department has come to you, ask for a service, ask for building a project for their research. Most of the time there is also indifference of what you meet at the meetings, uh, uh, faculty meetings, and they say, oh, you do that. And you think that they are computer support stuff instead of doing research, actually. Uh, there is incomprehension, misunderstanding of the value of what you do. And the first moment with the funding started to crumble, that you are the first to go, the first that are easy to cut. Because if you don't see the reason for being there, you don't understand the value, what they can take to you. And you see that they cost a lot of money because they have to hire a lot of people. And on the other side, that this hostility around builds an internal self-sufficiency. And you can say, well, they don't understand us, too bad. We understand each other, so we love each other. And there is a lack of intellectual engagement outside the pack. So we stay inside our um, uh, ebony tower. Um, after that, these days, we can see some movement, though, some change. Uh, and there is what I call the third uh, uh, social model, an emerging social model, the one of the tame wolves. Um, what is happening? It is happening, there is a progressive integration of the age within teaching programs, joint honors, certificates, minors, MAs, etc. And we have the presence of the age in disciplinary conferences uh, that are become even more important these days. So from a one sporadic paper, a different conference, now you have strands, you have even half conferences are taken over by digital. But we can ask how much this is real integration and what does it mean, integration, actually? 
Another article by Matthew Kirschenbau, what is a digital humanity, what is doing the English department, you can substitute English with anything you want, of course he's speaking from an American um, English perspective. And he elaborates a couple of models, what he called the library-like uh, model, the DH as a service, I already spoke about that, so you go there when you need something, that's a library, or you send your students to, to the library and you complain when it's closed, but ignore how it works. So it's something that is good to have, but not necessarily you know anything about it. And the second model is the one I call uh, myself uh, the Renaissance literature-like. I am within a, I work within a center for Renaissance studies, don't I? Um, meaning that uh, the Renaissance people do have their research and they go to conference which is named Renaissance, but they also so work with uh, uh, their, their own colleague in their department, like French department, Italian department, they teach the same students in a curriculum, but they also have these transversal things, because Renaissance is some kind of a sub-discipline, something that is interdisciplinary, if you want. Uh, this latter is particularly interesting. So if we believe that digital humanities is some sort of uh, uh, independent or sort of independent discipline, which is the models that applies to it. So if we have to create uh, models like digital history, digital English, digital classics, etc., how does it work? And here I have elaborated three different models, possible models of this happening. What I call the melding model, or the antagonistic model, and the bit by bit model. Let's see how they work very quickly. The melding model is the model of archaeology in my opinion. In fact, archaeology has a strong computational component. Archaeology is for the most part digital. It's an unthinkable to have a, uh, a curriculum in archaeology that does not imply some training to digital tools that has become fundamental. Uh, Graham, in the article I mentioned before, he said it might be that DH is a branch of archaeology, it's developed from archaeology. And uh, at that point, you can say, in his opinion, digital human does not exist. It's just the fact that it's within their own discipline and there is no need for creating a sub-discipline called digital archaeology. But we can ask if there is, that is all what there is. So you take one discipline, you add some digital tools and that's your DH. Isn't there any specific research potential in the computational methods per se? Can we not think that um, we can study the heuristic epistemology of the modeling, of the imaging, of space representations that not only apply to one discipline at a time, but is something transversal that cannot be applied across disciplines. That's a very complicated discussion we could have around these topics. I appreciate that I'm very quick here. The second model is the one I call the antagonistic model and is the one of computational linguistics. And here I use an article by Karen Spark Jones published in 2007. She's one of the mothers of the computational linguistics actually. And she asks which is the relationship between computational linguistics and linguistics. And she said uh, that in mainstream linguistic journal there is no trace of computational linguistics topics and vice versa. And the question is does it matter or not? Is that a problem that the two things are completely separate? She concludes after a while that there is um, computational linguistics does, does, does not need mainstream linguistics. It's a completely different thing. And uh, this is a very comforting but perhaps arrogant conclusion. But there you are. In fact, in the debate between the two, not only computational linguistic and linguistic have grown apart in the years, but there is basically no more interchange between the two anymore. And uh, in fact, computational linguistics is not linguistics done digitally, like archaeology was said before, but a result of an interdisciplinary research where computer scientists are not at service of linguistic, but they have merged with them and actually they have substituted them. Computational linguistics these days is mostly done by people coming from informatics, not from linguistics at all. Is that what is happening? That's uh, what we want to happen for the age disciplines? A separation? Everybody going their own part? Third model is what I call the bit-by-bit -bit model based on the model of digital paleography. 
Paleography since the 90s have been reflecting on the role of digital in their own research, and mainly research efforts on handwriting recognition. And uh, few, until a few years ago, there was a very frequent skepticism and refusal by mainstream paleographers to accept the use of computers. The late uh, uh, Petrucci, you said that uh, quantitative method in paleography simply cannot exist. In his opinion, it was a nonsense to talk about computers with paleography. A few years ago, a pioneering project called DigiPal has started to challenge this model. And uh, the key features of this project were they, instead of providing computational analysis of handwriting, as provided from within a support for traditional paleographers that wanted perhaps to use an enhanced method uh, by giving them some tools. Uh, they created an advisory board on this project, which was made by 50% of mainstream paleographers, not non-digital people, and has tried to find a balance between digital and non-digital. After a few years, digital paleography today looks completely different. It is now accepted and respected within mainstream paleography, Digital paleographers are accepted within the Comité International de Paléographie Latine, which is a big change because before it was absolutely close to it. There is a lot of articles, journals, conferences, seminars, workshop, projects, jobs, whatever in digital paleography is really kind of raging out there. Not all paleographers have become digital, but there is interchange between them. So by taking it slowly, by taking the time to talk to people, Digital paleography has achieved some, at the moment, a very nice balance, I would say. So, I arrived here very quickly at my conclusion. What is the content of the age? And really, so here we have as uh, an image I showed before, which is some few years ago, uh, John Answorth and Harold Short and William McCarthy have elaborated this. Uh, uh, what is digital humanities? Uh, a digital humanities is found in what they, they say it is the methodological commons at the center of all these disciplines uh, in the humanities. But in my opinion, is also modeling, is data structure, it is heuristics, hermeneutics, and what they call as crewmeneutics, the possibility of inventing, of doing things for fun and finding something new is also experimentation, it is prototyping, is all sort of methods and uh, attitude toward data and toward research that is, uh, uh, to my opinion, very exciting. And remediation of cultures, of course, that's very important. So, the problem is that the arrival of new medium has forced us to redefine the traditional disciplinary spaces. We may ask uh, these days if we still need disciplines in the humanities, traditional one, and if we need them, do we need exactly the same as we had before? In fact, we cannot under-evaluate, uh, underestimate the destructive and constructive power of the new medium, which is the same happened when invention of print. The new medium is able to redefine the geography, the disciplinary geography, and uh, pose us uh, very difficult questions. I conclude with this uh, uh, citation from William McCarthy that I use a lot in my presentation uh, because he really thinks, uh, makes us think differently what is digital humanities. He says, in the early stage of a new technology, people tend to think that its purpose is merely to replace and improve on something they already know. The promise of the new is thought to be quantitative. The new things will do the old job faster more efficiently and more cheaply. Tools, however, are perceptual agents. A new tool is not just a bigger lever and a more secure fulcrum, rather a new way of conceptualizing the world. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, Elena. So this was uh, the ideal introduction into this whole week on digital humanities, exactly what was needed to have an excellent start. Uh, the only uh, negative side, we uh, underestimated our time limits, but that's my fault and our organizers' fault. No, but you, you were fine. You're absolutely fine, and uh, we wouldn't have missed uh, any any word. Uh, so I think the the um, uh, strand rooms are open already, are, are going to be open, so uh, everyone is now supposed to switch and participate in their uh, uh, different strand. I think we should start 10 minutes, so I have a 10 minutes break. I'm afraid there is no time for discussion, uh, so many aspects can be debated and discussed uh, the whole day. I think it's, but it's fine to have uh, this uh, standing as it is. Uh, we can also transpose um, discussions to Twitter or in the chats or to uh, continue discussions in the individual strands and there will be uh, um, a final uh, um, roundup in the, the closing keynote session on Friday. So Elena, if you are available and uh, um, uh, to, to participate even there that you are most welcome if you're too busy that's, uh, that's uh, of course understandable so thank you very much indeed um, we meet in the individual stand strands now uh, just now I think you can access them already but I, I'd suggest uh, we start each uh, strand 10 minutes later anyone who wants to make uh, a specification from the strand responsibilities uh, responsibles. If this is not the case, then again, thank you very much, Elena Pierazzo, for this lucid and impressive talk. And we will meet again as soon as possible, and hopefully uh, in presence here in Venice. So we we will bring you here. I hope very much to your so. alma mater. So, <laughs> exactly. Sorry about that, but I forgot about. It. I knew it, but I, it wasn't mentioned in your CV that I had it. Then, so I then I would I doubt it. But yeah, that's All the right. reason why we wanted you for in any case here in, in in Venice. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for this uh, huge attendance of so more than one hundred participants. That's fantastic. 